what is the genetic history of Native Americans and how did they first arrive in America? Now, the United States of America isn't just the most powerful country in the world, it is the most powerful country in the history of the world. Yet, who were the first people to set foot on American soil? How long ago was this? And what haplogroups were common amongst them? Well, the story starts in Eurasia during the last ice age. This is because the two ancestral populations of Native Americans are ancient Northern East Asians and ancient North Eurasians, with a mixture of these populations creating a group known as the Ancient Paleo-Siberians. There was lots of mixing between these groups in Siberia around 25,000 years ago, yet these people soon split into two main groups. One group stayed in the land we call Russia today, and the indigenous populations that live in the Russian Far East, such as the Koryaks, are ancestors of these ancient Paleo-Siberians. The other group moved east, and eventually reached the Americas, and these people are the ancient ancestors of Native Americans. This is why there is a genetic connection between Native Americans and ancient Siberians, as a 2017 study published in Genome Research noted for instance. A particularly surprising finding was the genetic link between 24,000 year old Siberian Malta boy, Native Americans and the Western Siberians. This finding demonstrates a strong genetic link between Western Siberians and Native Americans due to their common ancient North Eurasian ancestry. But how did these ancient people actually get to America? Well, the route they most likely took was over the Bering Land Bridge between Siberia and Alaska, called Beringia. As during the last ice age, lower sea levels had exposed this land bridge. If this Bering Land Bridge theory is correct, and that is the most widely accepted theory in the academic literature, it seems to be the case that this land bridge wasn't simply a bridge that people raced across, but it would have been a homeland for many for multiple generations. As during the last glacial maximum, which was the period during the last ice age where ice was at its greatest extent, somewhere between 26 and 20,000 years ago, this land bridge was actually twice the size of Texas. This is a point noted by Jennifer Raff, who wrote a book on the genetic history of the Americas a few years ago, and who is the Associate Professor of Social and Behavioral Sciences Anthropology at the University of Kansas. This settlement around the Bering Land Bridge is associated with a lineage known as Ancient Beringian, who are ancient relations of Native Americans. This lineage is now extinct, probably due to Native Americans moving back into this area later on. As a 2018 study published in Nature found, this back migration from Native Americans either replaced or absorbed the initial founding population of Ancient Beringians. Now we know that around 17,000 years ago, the ice started to melt and the first Americans started moving south into the Americas. It seems that there's probably a number of waves of migration at different times, with these ancient peoples going on to spread across North and South America, establishing thousands of distinct cultures, languages and societies. Between around 16,000 and 13,000 years ago, these populations expanded rapidly, with limited competition for resources and game animals with no fear of human populations, perhaps some of the reasons for this. The ancestries of these first peoples would split into various branches over time, including Northern Native Americans and Southern Native Americans, and genetic diversity has evolved over time in many respects. Later migrations also added some further genetic diversity to the indigenous peoples across the whole of the Americas as well, with certain peoples in South America having some Australasian ancestry for instance. Yet most indigenous peoples across the Americas share a common lineage that can be traced back to these ancient Siberian and Northeast Asian populations. The early peopling of America is associated with various ancient peoples, including the Clovis culture. This culture takes its name from Clovis Points, which have been found across America. And the major archaeological site for these people was in New Mexico. It seems that Clovis Points were attached to poles and served as multifunctional tools, including for hunting animals. It used to be thought that the Clovis people were the first people in the Americas, around 13,000 years ago, but we now know there were groups in the Americas at least one or 2,000 years before then. Findings from a site at Monte Verde in modern Chile are dated to around 14,500 years ago, for example. I should note that there are much older estimates as to when the first person in the Americas was. Some studies put it around 30,000 years ago, for instance. But even if this is true, this seemed very small, and any significant peopling of America only appears to have happened after the last glacial maximum that ended around 20,000 years ago. But what do we know about the haplogroups around this time? Well, the founding populations of the Native Americans belong to subclads of haplogroup Q on the Y DNA side. 
With haplogroup QM242, the predominant haplogroup amongst Native Americans today. This haplogroup is still quite common in people who live in Siberia as well, again demonstrating these ancient links between the two. The Y-DNA haplogroup CM130 is less common but still worth mentioning, as it is still found in Native American men as well, but at lower levels compared to Q. On the maternal side, Native American mitochondrial DNA is largely dominated by haplogroups A, B, C, D and X. Scientists have also sequenced the DNA of early ancestors of Native Americans, including Anzic I, who was a two-year-old boy who lived nearly 13,000 years ago and was found in Montana. He is associated with the Clovis culture and he belonged to the mitochondrial haplogroup D4H3A and the Y-DNA haplogroup QL54 of M3. The 2014 study that sequenced the genome of this boy concluded that their data was compatible with the hypothesis that ANZEC-1 belonged to a population directly ancestral to many contemporary Native Americans. Native Americans and the various indigenous peoples of the Americas lived in relative isolation for large periods, but there was perhaps occasional contact with different groups. It is an interesting thought to wonder if a Viking ever set foot on the land we call the United States of America today. We know for instance that the Vikings reached the east coast of Canada, with ancient Icelandic sagas talking about this in the Vinland sagas, which were written down in the 13th century, but they discuss events that happened around 1000 AD. Vinland was the word the Vikings used for their settlement, which is thought to mean the land of vines or wingland. We know for instance that there was a Norse settlement at Lansom Meadows in Newfoundland on the east coast of Canada. Since we know that the Vikings reached the east coast of modern Canada, is it such a stretch to imagine that some of them perhaps sailed a little further and reached the east coast of America, perhaps around the New York area? Well, this is a map in the back of the Vinland Sagas that shows a voyage to a place the Vikings called Hop or Tidal Pool. On the far left of the map, with some interpretations saying this was actually the area of modern New York. And we do have a little detail on this trip in Eric the Red Saga, which describes how the Vikings briefly traded and then fought with native peoples. Now throughout the Vinland Sagas there are numerous stories of the Vikings trading and fighting with the natives, but these stories, if true, probably detail events on the east coast of Canada. The following excerpt is from a story from a Viking voyage to Hop, however, which again could be on the east coast of America around New York today. The story details how Thorfinn Karlsefni, an Icelandic explorer, led a crew to explore further south into Vinland. An interesting point to note is that Karlsefni and his wife actually had a child in Vinland called Snorri, who is considered the first European ever to be born in North America. The story in Eric the Red Saga describes the first encounter Karlsefni and his crew had with the indigenous people of Hop, how they traded with them and the ultimate conflict that arose. Karlsefni headed south around the coast with Snorri and Bjarni and the rest of their company. They sailed a long time until they came to a river which flowed into a lake and from there into the sea. Karlsefni and his company sailed into the lagoon and called the land Hop or Tidal Pool. Early one morning, they noticed nine hide-covered boats, and the people in them waved wooden poles. They made a swishing sound as they turned them around sunwise. Carol Sefney then spoke. What can this mean? Snorri replied, It may be a sign of peace. We should take a white shield and lift it up in return. This they did. The others then rode towards them and were astonished at the sight of them as they landed on the shore. They were short in height, with threatening features and tangled hair on their heads. Their eyes were large and their cheeks broad. They stayed there a while, marvelling, then rode away again to the south around the point. One morning as spring advanced, they noticed a large number of hide-covered boats rowing up from the south around the point. There were so many of them and there was a pole waving from each boat. They signalled with their shields and began trading with the visitors, who wished to trade for red cloth. They also wanted to purchase swords and shields, but Carol Sefney and Snorri forbade this. They traded dark pelts for the cloth, and for each pelt they took a cloth a hand in length, which they then bound around their heads. At this point, a bull ran out of the forest and bellowed loudly. The natives took fright of this, ran to their boats and rode off to the south. Three weeks passed and there was no sign of them. After that, they saw a large group of native boats approaching from the south. They were waving poles counter some wise now, and all of them were shrieking loudly. The men took up their red shields and went towards them. 
They met and began fighting. A hard barrage rained down and the natives also had catapults. Carol, Stephanie and Snorri then saw the natives lift up on poles a large round object, about the size of a sheep's gut and black in colour, which came flying up on the land and made a threatening noise when it landed. It struck great fear into Carol, Stephanie and his men, who decided their best course was to flee upriver, since the natives' party seemed to be attacking from all sides. So although it's not clear if this was in the east coast of Canada or America, and you could also debate how historically accurate the sagas are, this could well have been an encounter between the Native Americans and Vikings. We know for sure that the Native Americans would soon meet Europeans however, with the age of European colonisation and settlement beginning in the 15th and 16th century. A combination of warfare, forced displacements and most devastatingly, disease, reduced Native American populations significantly. This was because Native Americans had no immunity to diseases like smallpox, influenza and measles, which were introduced by European settlers. These Europeans also brought new genetics and haplogroups into America as well, such as the Y-DNA haplogroups R1B and I and the mitochondrial haplogroup H for instance, which are pretty common in America today amongst people of European descent. However, this is a story for another time and the Native American presence is still felt in America today, around 15,000 years after their ancient ancestors crossed the Bering Land Bridge and into the Americas. But speaking of these early Europeans, many had ancestry that connects to England. But what is the genetic history of England? To find out, please click here. Thanks for watching, please subscribe and hit the bell, and let me know your thoughts in the comments below, and I'll see you next time.